after exploring the problem and getting a look at some of the shiny new technologies, what we're also what we're doing now is having a think about what this means for us as a society. There are social, cultural, ethical, all kinds of implications of some of the things we've been talking about. So the speakers in this session are going to talk about some of those considerations, They're going to talk about some of those hurdles, some of the stuff that would need to be addressed or could need to be addressed before this kind of technology rolls out, which, as we know, in some cases is a couple of decades away. But as we've also known, as we've also raised a few times, the conversation needs to start now to build social licence or to get a sense of what people want to happen with this technology. So each of the speakers is going to speak for about eight-ish minutes, as you know, we've seen there's a bit of you know in slack in that. But our first two speakers are actually online, and this is going to test me and the technology. <laughs> It's okay though because they're pre-recorded, the first two speakers. So our first speaker, when I do that, I'll introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Professor Dan Tompkins, who he leads New Zealand's predator-free 2050s, uh, uh, 2050s, which is a, or the science strategy, which aims to remove invasive predators from New Zealand by 2050. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Dan Tompkins and I'm the Science Director at Predator Free 2050 Limited in New Zealand. Today I'm going to talk about a perspective on next generation technology development from a conservation stakeholder. Uh, so what is the context that I'm coming from? Well, Predator Free 2050 uh, is New Zealand's mission to eradicate the key predators impacting native biodiversity by the, from the whole country by 2050. And this is a, a mission that is uh, described as aspirational. Uh, this was a, a mission launched in 2016, and we know that we don't have the tools and approaches that we need to get the, the job done right now. It's been likened to New Zealand's Apollo mission, but a focus is needed on the science and technology that will give us the breakthroughs, that will give us the tools and approaches that we need to get the full job done across the whole country. So why uh, we focused on this and why the urgency? Well, really, uh, despite decades of awesome conservation work by many people, 80% uh, of our native bird populations in New Zealand are still in decline. And the primary impact is the exotic predators uh, that Predator 3 2050 mission is focused on eradicating. So there's an urgent need. Our bird populations are still going down. And this biodiversity decline, it's not just a New Zealand problem. It's, it's a global problem uh, all over the world. Many of you will recognize the IUCN red list here that shows the percentages of uh, endangered and threatened species uh, per taxa globally. Uh, the key point to note is the, horse, is the vertical red line, which shows the estimate for the proportion of species that are threatened. And it's going anywhere from 65% down to 40% for amphibians, 25% um, for mammals, 15% for birds globally. So really, uh, we are in a biodiversity uh, arm again. And what can we do to tackle this? Well, at the moment, we don't have the tools and approaches. And if there's one message you take home from this talk today is that we urgently need faster realization of real world benefits from science for conservation and the environment. And it's not just biodiversity, it's climate change, pollution, the issues are stacking up. So what can we do? Well, this is the system of science that we have to work with. How can we make the system run faster um, to give us better real-world impact. Um, the key point to note here, it's complicated. Um, we have the end game of trying to achieve the real-world benefit. And then we have, you'll recognize the, the far to mid to close um, horizon science areas going from breakthroughs from discovery science through to that translation to proof of concept, who's the testing and best practice in the field, the, the real applied science. And of course, uh, the complexity is not just the science alone. Uh, we've got a huge wealth of underpinning biology, technology, ecology, knowledge with which to inform um, our management of science through this system. And with even more complexity is the, the socio-political context in which we have to operate. We've got policy and law, ethics, culture and social license. And what you find is the further down the R&D pipeline from discovery to coalface that you get is these factors shift and change. So from the knowledge base, for example, while ecology is really important at the coalface, when you're considering blue sky science, it's really the underpinning biology and technology that dictates what has the better chance of being, um, being successful. 
likewise in the socio-political landscape um, for research out of the environment in the lab in confinement really it's the policy and law surrounding that science and research that takes priority the closer to the coalface that you get wanting to apply new technologies for conservation benefit though the more and more important other factors ethics culture and social license become so how as a conservation stakeholder um, can i work with this system when i want to try and speed up the realization of real world benefit for conservation key at the first is a real focus a real prioritization and what are the specific bits of work that will make the most difference in terms of new technology development if we have areas of science, um, other areas of science, for example, from uh, robotics or AI or social science that can overcome the hurdles that we are being faced with in the wild right now, we'll go there, if, particularly if they offer greater benefit for lower risk. However, in the case where no other research pathway can really deliver us what we need, a genetic biocontrol is an option. But again, when considering the research pathway um, to that kind of development, we're only really going to look for new discovery science if there's nothing that we can do with the cold face or the concepts that we already know about. Because, of course, the further to the far horizon you go, the greater the risk of failure, um, the more parallel research streams you have to fund so that one might come off. But also the greater the number of steps of complexity and translation and field testing you have to go through, and the greater the socio-political consideration that's needed to actually realize benefits from that science. So really, we're only looking to that breakthrough space and really where we have limited other options. And of course, this whole consideration is driven both by um, and informed by the knowledge that we have across the sciences um, and also the um, the consideration from the socio-political landscape. One key thing that I'll highlight right now, though, is that for most of the discovery and tra translational science space, is we're often confronted with large knowledge gaps. People don't know whether they think it's going to be safe or not. People don't know whether they want it or not. And the key biggest request is always for more information. We need more information to make informed decisions. And this is both the decision makers working in the conservation space and also the general public. And so um, in, instead of the push often that you hear sometimes that we don't know enough about this science, we really shouldn't be doing it. The, the reverse is true where we have knowledge gaps that we need more information, the only way to get that more information is to do the science. Bearing in mind that a decision to do the science is by no means a decision to use that science and that technology in the real world. The decision to do science is based on the need to fill knowledge gap, to work down the horizon to the benefit for conservation. So really, just to finish off, I'm afraid this is a very short talk. Uh, I could talk for hours on this. But a few implications what I see for genetic biocontrol R&D. Firstly, really, um, for delivering real-world benefits, new technology should prioritize its focus only when we have insufficient other options for more close horizon avenues um, that, act, that tend to carry less risk and less unknown. And any technology development, be it close horizon or far horizon, should always be objectively interrogated against the underpinning knowledge bases and the socio-political context. Such interrogation may show that close horizon science really can't see what we need to save the environment. But then it might also show that um, more fundamental ideas, when considered in an ecological light, may never really be suitable, uh, and in a social light may never be acceptable. So that constant interrogation is always needed. A key point though, really, I've said once already though, is that the uncertainty over the real world applicability of discovery and translational science should never be a barrier to doing that research. If there's uncertainty, we need more knowledge. To get that more knowledge, we need to do that research. Doing the research is not a commitment to apply, it's a commitment to fill knowledge gaps to inform decision makers about whether such approaches should be applied or not. So such uncertainty increases the need for research. That's where we get the information from. And finally, I'm going to end up uh, slightly provocatively um, with kind of some delusional requests 
um, from the R&D system, and particularly in the genetic biocontrol space, but also across all um, R&D. Really, as a conservation stakeholder, um, research and application is most powerful when they are kept independent of each other, when the governance of research and the governance of conservation management are kept separate, informed by each other for sure, but the decision making should be separate. Um, there's nothing worse than scientists lobbying for application of particular technology or stakeholders trying to limit the science that's conducted. Um, that cross contamination weakens both sides. Clean governance of research and application is essential. And also, while it's acknowledged that research is risky, and I know the system drives us to do this, can we please stop overselling new technology to get funding? It really diverts resources away from more beneficial areas, and it makes the rates of delivery failure even higher, which then has concerns surrounding trust and, and um, whether these are the best directions or faith in the technology to solve any problems. But then on the other hand, can research support be more agile? We really need faster shifting from old areas offering less benefit to new areas, such as genetic biocontrol, offering more benefit for the target areas where it does clearly objectively offer that benefit. And finally, can we better balance the kudos and plaudits associated with applied and cold-faced research? And can we really get away from the focus on papers, huge amount of wasted effort um, on supporting uh, an academic machinery, an industry, really, when excellence at all horizons is equally important to realize the real-world benefits uh, that conservation and the environment needs. And finally, just to sort of um, conclude, you may all recognize what's called the Gartner hype cycle. This is the pattern we go through at new technology discovery. We have a trigger. We have huge expectations that are, um, that are fed on and pushed but then they never come off. We enter the top of disillusionment, and then it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of noise, a lot of wasted resources to get to the benefits being realized. Wouldn't it be better if we could be more objective, logical, better coordinated, and actually over deliver in a much faster timescale for the benefit of conservation and the environment? Thank you very much, and I apologize for being too preachy. Um, but hopefully we'll have more time to take questions at the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. I know Dan's online on uh, watching himself, watching himself being watched by us, um, which is a bit meta there. So thank you very much, Dan. Thank you for the provocative commentary as well. And I think the, the idea of um, avoiding the trough of disillusionment in technology rollout and uptake is an excellent idea. Also, I love the call for faster translation of science. I think that's a really important thing. Our, our second speaker, and, and so Dan and, and our second speaker, Ben Phillips, uh, will hopefully, if technology works for us, will join us in the roundtable conversation so you can ask them questions. Um, but um, our second speaker is Professor Ben, or yes, Professor Ben Phillips, who is talking about work that he did at the University of Melbourne, uh, even though he's not there at the minute, um, with uh, as a population ecologist with research modelling cane toad invasions. And so I will now do the same thing, which will seamlessly work. Hello, everyone. The first time I heard about uh, gene drives, which was about 10 years ago, I immediately thought, that's a terrible idea. Um, anytime uh, we put, uh, you know, we let humans drive just about anything, um, surprising things can happen. And I'd come from a background in um, invasion biology, which, of course, is littered with um, uh, examples of, of things that people thought were a good idea that then turned out to be a bad idea. Um, I've since come around um, quite a long way, in fact. Um, uh, firstly, my, I guess the, my, my first bit of solace was I thought, oh, it's a great idea, but it'd probably never work. Um, so I'll talk about some of the uh, reasons why, um, I guess some of the problems and, and why it's difficult potentially to get these things to work. Um, but, but further, I guess I've come around to the, to the notion that, um, you know, uh, gene drives really do offer um, an amazing promise, I think, um, for solving problems that are, are utterly intractable otherwise. And I think they're potentially also um, an ethically superior way forward. So we all will have heard by now that um, gene drives um, essentially um, manifest super Mendelian inheritance. So they skew 
um, they skewed the inheritance towards uh, towards the gene drive in such a way that you end up with a lot more copies of the gene drive than you would expect um, under standard Mendelian inheritance. Now, it's important to remember that what this does is it allows us to push things against natural selections, right? So natural selection doesn't ever go away um, and it's important to remember this. And so what gene drives are really doing is, is allowing us to push uh, things into populations um, against the force of natural selection. Um, and so, for example, for a suppression gene drive, where we're hoping to um, skew sex ratios towards males in such a way that the population eventually collapses, we're setting up um, very strong selection um, um, as, as the sex ratio skews, we're, we're setting up very strong selection, or certainly the potential for very strong selection. But of course, that potential can't manifest unless there's variation in critical traits. Um, but of course, you know, this is one of the reasons that evolution is so difficult to predict is that um, natural selection doesn't really care what traits solve the problem, right? So there's a, a vast number of potential traits that might allow populations to evolve around uh, a gene drive that's skewing sex ratios. So just a few examples, for example, um, obviously an obvious one would be a drive-resistant allele, right? So an allele that pops up that won't uh, allow the drive to work, right? Um, as the sex ratio skews, that allele comes under very strong selection and gets um, amplified in the population. Um, another potential, uh, and so, so drive-resistant alleles, people have been looking quite hard at that and they've found ways of, of um, I guess, working around that idea of drive-resistant alleles. So I think to some extent that's almost solved, um, but of course it will depend upon the size of the population, right? So the bigger the population, the more likely it is that you're gonna find something in there that's resistant to the drive. The second problem, which I think almost nobody is working on yet, is the idea of mate choice um, and, and mate recognition. So, for example, if in that previous slide the mosquitoes really did turn pink and male as well, um, there'd be very strong selection for females to avoid mating with pink males, right? So, um, whatever it is that uh, that females use to to um, determine mates, um, and there's obviously a wide uh, variety of of cues that females use. Um, if there's anything that's detectable about, about the drive, um, then uh, there's potentially selection there for females to avoid mating with males that have it. So once again, um, small populations, you've got a reasonable chance of, of I guess, pushing the drive through before um, evolution responds, but as the population gets larger, you're gonna struggle. Um, and another example where, where there might be variation that selection can act upon is, is um, genetic sex determination, right? So um, not all species have purely genetic sex determination. In fact, there's all sorts of complicated um, sex determining mechanisms out there, in, including environmental sex determination. So, and, and again, in many species that won't be very well studied, right? So uh, it's entirely possible that there's variation out there in the way that sexes are determined. Um, and again, once we drive um, a, a suppression um, we're, we're trying to produce population suppression with the gene drive. Um, we're exposing all of that variation, um, which is currently kind of hidden to selection. So the basic takeaway uh, message here is that um, there's a lot of variation out there that may ultimately affect our capacity to push these things through large populations in particular. So once again, small populations, you've got a good chance of getting through. Um, bigger populations, there's going to be all this kind of variation you see in there that we are often unaware of and will only become apparent once we try to drive the suppression, um, you know, to suppress the population. So that's the evolutionary side, but then there's also this, you know, basic ecological side, right? So all of the populations that we're looking to, you know, the, the big populations that we're looking to, to control, they all live in space, right? Um, that seems pretty obvious. Um, Giridan and uh, Debar uh, last year made this really uh, nice graphic, I think, which points out the problem. You, what's happened here is you've got a drive that's been introduced on the right. Um, it started to suppress the population, which is shown in green, and it's starting to push towards the left, right? Now, what it's doing in it, when it's pushing towards the left is it's pushing against natural selection, which we've already talked about, but it's now also pushing against the force of ecological invasion, right? So there's essentially asymmetric gene flow pushing down that, that green gradient. Um, and so that's another issue that the drive has to be able to push against, right? So there's now two forces that it's pushing against. And as well as that, um, out on that right-hand side there, you can see the population sizes are very low. Um, you have a lot of drift. Um, and when I say it's spatial drift, it's, it's more like a founder event, but it's happening serially. So it's happening all the time. And what that drift can do is it can cause surprising things to happen. For example, um, empty space can be recolonized by wild types. Um, so a little population can pop up that's free of the gene drive. And this can lead to a dynamic called chasing, which was first really identified by 
Jackson Champer and colleagues. Um, but it can look like this. So this is a simulation that Jeff Parrell, one of my postdocs, put together recently. Um, we've got the drive, um, you know, suppressing uh, individuals in space. So yellow individuals carry the drive, obviously. Um, and you can see that it's chasing the wild type population around. Never quite managing this tendency, almost. Um, and so it's constantly trying to recolonize, but all that empty space ends up getting recolonized by, um, by wild types. And ultimately what happens in this simulation is even after hundreds of generations, um, eventually the drive actually finds itself going extinct. Right, so here's a situation where we've got a drive that should work in a spatial environment, um, but we put it into space, we get this issue of spatial drift happening, um, and that can cause all sorts of com complex things to occur. So Jeff and I actually mapped out all of the possibilities Let's ignore the right hand side, the left hand side for, for a second. Just look at the right hand side where we've got significant stochasticity, which is pretty much always going to happen. Um, we can either have, for example, we can have the wild type pop through the drive, and it's, and it's got its a kind of drive free population. That can be recolonized by the drive under certain circumstances, and that can lead to that chasing um, that, we, that we saw um, in that previous graphic. Alternatively, um, we can have this situation where it doesn't recolonize, pushes up against a, a boundary here, um, and you see the wild type and the, the wild type over here going extinct and the drive going extinct, and then the wild type just recolonizes, which is kind of the ultimate um, outcome of that previous simulation. Right, so we can get quite a lot of complicated um, dynamics occurring. What seems to be, so there's a lot more work to be done in this area, but, but some basic rules seem to be that um, as dispersal um, increases, um, we have a higher probability that the drive will succeed. And the other interesting thing is that drives that seem to be better at uh, driving populations extinct in a spatial environment are slower drives. So they're kind of the ones that you wouldn't pick in an aspatial environment. Anyway, so there's a lot of work to be done uh, in this space. Uh, and one of the other things is uh, there might be more fundamental ways that we can make this problem of, of chasing go away completely. Um, and so um, we're working on, on some of those ideas as well. And they just leverage basic population dynamics and try to get the population into a space uh, where chasing won't happen. So yeah, so there's still quite a few problems to be resolved, I think, um, and there's quite a lot of work to be done about uh, before, you know, about getting drives to actually work uh, in the real world. And I'll leave it at that, thanks. Fascinating, thank you so much, Ben. Um, very fascinating, it's so interesting to to think about all those various selective pressures that are where nature will always win in the end. That's very interesting. Um, so we will move to our third speaker, um, Dr. Asigur Biran from the University of Adelaide. Asigur is going to be talking about more theoretical models, but what we can learn from them in application. So I'm going to try to give you some insights from theoretical models in addition to what Ben already talked about. Just to give a brief, brief overview of what's going on in theoretical modeling. There are basically two approaches we, we use. It's either analytical models that are mathematically heavy, but biologically simple, or you have, on the other hand, computer simulations, which are complex. You can really have realistic um, biological scenarios, but you lose the generality with it. So you have to do lots of simulations to be able to get a general idea of what's going on. Given the complexity of problem of introducing gene drive carrying individuals to wild, you really want to have realistic um, scenarios so that you can really predict what's going to happen. So you really have to rely on computer simulations. And the current status on computer simulations is that typically in gene drive theoretical model literature, you will see non-spatial models and everybody's mating with everybody. And um, they are generally not species specific. If they are species specific, they are mostly on mosquitoes. Um, typically, they will use non-overlapping generations. That is, you'll have adults, they will produce offspring. Adults will die, offspring will become adults. So you have no overlap. So you don't really get a sense of how long the gene drive will um, take in effect. They won't consider fitness consequences, whether there's going to be mate choice against these derived carrying individuals or whether they will have lower survival in the wild. And they will assume single mating. They will not assume 
potential problems with polyandry, whether the gene drive carrying individuals have some sperm compromised, you know, if they cannot um, compete with the wild sperm. And they will talk about small population sizes. So with our um, framework, we try to overcome these uh, limitations. It's an individual-based model with a relatively simple life cycle. You have mate search, um, and it's spatial, so it's, um, you can only mate with the ones that are close to you. You cannot mate with everybody else. It's polyandrous mating, so there's prob uh, potential for sperm competition. There's mate choice, um, and then there's offspring production depends on the number of resources that are available, so there's some ha habitat information as well. And if the offspring is produced, then they're going to disperse from their natal habitat to other potential areas. And generations are overlapping. That means there's some survival probability. Adults can survive and still be present in the population. If there's not many mates for adults in the area, they can also disperse to new areas to find mates. So this keeps repeating itself. There are multiple breeding cycles in a year. And typically, we use this for mice, um, to model mice. And we looked at, as Paul mentioned, homing drive, um, egg shredder, and uh, T crisper. I'm just going to give you a brief outline, because eight minutes is nothing. So you've already seen a slide, and this is repeating what Ben Phillips showed earlier. And even though it's patch-based model, we still see chasing. What is interesting is that it's not the slow drive here, but it's the super efficient drive that is failing. So your cutting efficiency is really high, which is not working for your benefit because dispersal is low. So basically what's happening is that the drive is working very well, suppressing the local population, disappearing, but then the other wild individuals are coming from elsewhere. So you see the chase is happening, and it just doesn't disappear. Um, or alternatively, as we already heard about these we don't like the resistant alleles. So you will see if your cutting efficiency is good, but the loss of function in the target gene that you are targeting is not good, then you will have these resistant genotypes emerging really fast and then spreading back to the entire landscape. So we, that was for mice. We said, well, what about the other species? Can we just sort of have this thinking exercise whether what happens if we apply gene drive to these species. Um, to make it somewhat comparable, we said, okay, let's say 200,000 individuals of mice, 200,000 individuals of foxes and stuff, and whether um, how long will it take to eradicate. Of course, to make it comparable, when you fix the number of individuals, the area that you're talking about is very different. So we said, okay, based on density estimates from literature, Foxes live in 100 square kilometer, 100,000 square kilometers, whereas mice live in 40 kilometers square or something. So we scaled our landscape for that um, and gathered um, parameters from literature. I just want you to focus on the column with the survival probability. Basically, as the animal gets larger, their survival probability is higher, their generations are longer. And the dispersal abilities in the scale when we um, scale them to the model, mice and cats have lower dispersal abilities compared to the other species. So here's what you get. Um, what you see in this graph is the simulation results for 1,000 simulations for each species, and the bulge tells you the time where the most of the simulations ended. So for um, mice, it's around 14 years, and for rat, it's slightly higher. Cats and foxes, 150 years or so. And the color denotes the probability of eradication. So the lighter the color, the chances are not so great. Um, so if this was only related to survival, you would see a similar shape going across because they're sort of linearly increasing in terms of their survival probability. But it's not only survival, it's dispersal abilities plus the polyandry. So their life history is really important when you're considering these. Um, I don't know how to put this politically correct way, but gene drives are working good. And, you know, if you have millions of dollars, I would bet on mice and rats and rabbits. Not so much on the other ones. Um, perhaps um, immunocontraception is a good way to go for cats. Um, hopefully I convinced you that, you know, 
these um, compl compl complex life history traits are important, and with our modeling framework, we shift the dial a little bit. But of course, there are other things to consider, like multiple species in the environment, how they are going to compete with each other, or more habitat heterogeneity or seasonality in the environment. All these things have to be considered, and our framework can handle those. If you're interested, the code is available, and you can push the dial even further. But what is more important is that when you put uh, the parameters into the model, if you put garbage in, you will get garbage out. So you really need reliable field data. And it's surprising that we don't know much about these species that we are trying to get rid of. There is not much data available, and there should be more money poured in for field work. Yeah. Thanks. Do you want to do, we do that thing where we you do, you do that vocals on your keyboard? Yep. Um, brilliant. Thank you, Asigur. That is fantastic. I'm, um, oh, what I find so fascinating is that we have this technology that's pushing the boundaries of gene technology, which is then pushing the boundaries of modelling technology. So modelling technology is kind of advancing on the basis of the need to be able to model more. Done? Pretty good? Yes. Brilliant. Excellent. Uh, model more and better and different outcomes. It's, it's quite remarkable. Um, so our, our um, fourth speaker, doing a quick count, um, in this session, uh, again presenting an, again another different perspective, is, is James Tresize from the Invasive Species Council. And James is going to be talking to us about social licence, in particular with reference to our friends, the horses. Um, hi everyone, my name's James Tresize, obviously a Conservation Director at the Invasive Species Council. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging uh, the traditional owners whose land we are on also and their continuing connect connection to country uh, and that this land was actually taken from them. Let's start about just biocontrol and social licence. Uh, so <laughs> I think from an invasive species point of view we've got a really good example of one of the challenges of biocontrol, social licence and invasive species management and it's probably the most well understood biocontrol experiment that's under, been undertaken in Australia that's rapidly misfired and become one of our biggest invasive species problems. So when we talk about social license and framing and, and the communications challenge of how we talk about invasive, invasive species issues, keep in the back of your mind uh, the cane toad, uh, what happened with the cane toad, what went wrong with the cane toad and, and how that is anchoring and shaping people's perceptions of things like biocontrol. I'm sure everyone already does, but it's, I think, just an important point to start. So let's talk about social licence. Um, does anyone know what that map up there represents? It's, it, it's, it's nothing to do with invasive species. That map is um, the results of the same-sex marriage plebiscite that happened quite a few years ago. I was thinking about what is a good graphical representation of social license? I think that is quite an effective graphical rep representation of social license. The majority of Australians in the majority of the country uh, have voted uh, to adopt support same-sex marriage. And there was a lot of um, elements that we can learn from campaigning and communications about how uh, Australia got to that point. But the other point I'd like to make is that social licence is very uh, divorced, or not very divorced, it's somewhat divorced from what we often assume social licence is about, which is political power and power to affect change. And so if you think back to the same-sex marriage debate, um, it started many years before the plebiscite, and actually political power and vested interest was used to stymie um, uh, action on this particular issue, despite there already being a broad base level of support and social licence for it to happen. So never underestimate vested interests. I'll give you a very good example <laughs> from today um, around feral horses. And maybe we'll get to it if we have time, but I don't think we will in eight minutes. So let's bring it back to our issue, invasive species and nature. Um, and that's the perspective that we come from. We're an environmental organisation. We're very concerned about the impact invasive species have on nature. So let's talk about why people care about nature. Well, 
we all have our own reasons and we've talked, I've heard the word values and um, talk about people's values come up quite a bit today in other discussions. Well, this is what the research says. Uh, and these are pretty consistent findings. Why do people care about nature? Well, the most the strongest two are around the impact on future generations, so what it means for our kids and our grandkids, uh, and around this idea of national pride and identity. And what that actually means is around uh, Australia's unique place in the world, you know, our high level of endemic species, our platypus wombats, things that don't occur anywhere else. So we're very proud of that. So don't take that to mean um, kind of nationalistic uh, viewpoints. Below that, and on the, on, in those brackets, you see some other percentages. They're a bit um, uh, presented this way. They don't quite tell the whole story, which is they're nowhere near as strong as those first two. So the next two are critical health and well-being and um, critical to the economy. And the reason they're not as strong is because that, those percentages combine the strongly support and support. And so for the first, the top two, the 95 and 94%, far greater strong support from um, the survey participants. And now this is from an unpublished survey of 2,900 Australians weighted um, to the ABS average. So it's a, it's a, it's a very um, reliable um, piece of social science. So where are we at with biodiversity and nature? Well, I, I view it as there's three cascading problems when it gets down to invasive species. First is that from a policy perspective, time and time again, the research shows us that uh, the environment, and I'm um, decoupling environment and climate change here, the environment ranks far below other considerations when it comes to voter preferences um, and what people are primarily concerned about in their day-to-day -day lives. What is in it for me? So healthcare, economy, um, continually trump uh, environment um, to a quite an extent and, and more increasingly, particularly in the current environment, cost of living. So environment's already kind of low down on the list of where of everyday Australians' concerns. It's not, great, not a great place to start. But when we start talking about the extinction of native wildlife and go back to that previous slide, people actually deeply care about um, the concept of extinction. We learn about it from a young age. We learn about dinosaurs. Like, you know, we learn about it. Extinction is one of the first biological concepts we actually learn about as people when we start learning about what happened with the dinosaurs. Fun fact. But then when we get to within the environment, invasive species are actually a subset and are often trumped by other issues. And so they're not high on people's agenda. And so what do I mean by that? It's a poorly understood issue. So when we look at invasive species, are one of the most significant threats to our environment, 56% uh, of Australians um, support, that, support that statement. 32% uh, neither agree or nor disagree. And so that, that's kind of what we consider our persuadables. Um, a similar um, statistic on that top right-hand corner, I've combined a few studies here, invasive species ranked 13th on a study of um, almost 3,000 people looking at perception of major threats to nature. So um, when in reality they are one of the major drivers of extinction across the country. This is a study from Xander and Elle, and I just want to um, highlight the complexity around how people perceive invasive species. So just these two um, bar charts here, what they represent is, is it acceptable to manage, um, uh, to kill feral animals if they are harming threatened species? And you've got 71% support there. Is it acceptable to manage feral animals provided no animals get harmed? And you've got another 70% there. So that's the same survey population, and quite clearly there's some cognitive dissonance or some disassociation that goes when, when those respondents were completing that survey. But it also shows the, the multiple positions any individual person can take. We're full of these contradictions. So if you've read um, Daniel Kahneman's work, you'll, you'll know that there's these kind of psychological concepts. What you see is all there is. And when it comes to invasive species issues, what you see is not all there is. Um, if you were to think about feral horses, and we'll go there now, <laughs> um, the way if you were looking at the news today, you'd think um, perception of feral horse control, particularly in Kosciuszko, the way it's portrayed in the media, the way people talk about it, you'd think there is this huge opposition there uh, that far trumps the, the amount of people who are supportive of this issue and that you've got this kind of middle undecided um, proportion. And in reality, the, the, the bar charts are the circle, the so, um, the size of those groupings are far different. And actually, when we do the analysis, the supportive element of society is actually larger than the opposed. The opposition is smaller. And let's see if it happens. No, it doesn't. And that undecided 
chart is actually bigger as well, but it didn't work. So, so one of the challenges for communicating around invasive species issues, biocontrol, and, and what we need to learn, we need to work out who is with us, we need to work out who we need to talk to, who are those persuadables, and we need to really understand who is not going to be with us no matter what we say. They're just locked in and opposed. And on almost every issue, you'll find, you'll find those, um, those positions. The other interesting thing that we've learned from the social research around invasive species communication and conservation more broadly is we need to start with what we're trying to save. So let's start talking about bilbies and corroboree frogs and we don't need, and then lead people, once we've got people in on those issues, then let's start talking about the methods to control the major threats to the things that people care about. Give this as an example. That is a big, beautiful animal. And it is really hard to talk about what um, we need to do to stop that animal destroying the habitats of the native species that evolved here that don't occur anywhere else in the world. So one of the challenges is how we communicate and how we tell these stories. So rather than putting up images of the uh, threat, uh, invasive species um, and kind of uh, making them icons, we actually need to demonstrate and portray and exactly the damage that they are doing. The other thing that social research has told us is that we need to demonstrate that we are considering all the options in the toolbox. So if we go straight to, and we've had that conversation today, I think, a bit in some of the earlier sessions. If we go straight to lethal control, but we don't demonstrate actually, here are the other control mechanisms that we have contemplated, and actually lethal control is the most effective, efficient, and uh, is the only one that's going to work, Unless we explain that journey, people don't come with us. Now, that's the challenge with feral horses. Trapping and rehoming feral horses would be ideal if we could get it to work. Unfortunately, it does not work. We've got 14,000 feral horses now in Kosciuszko, and there isn't 14,000 homes waiting for them. And so the reality is to get the number down is we have to do uh, the difficult things like lethal control. It's really important though we approach those discussions and again this is what the social research tells us with empathy and humility because people have their, their values and once we explain it in terms that people understand you can get those persuadables. Now you're not going to get the rusted ons, you're not going to get the people such as the Ray Hadleys who's gone off today on this particular issue but you will get the people who are, who are going to listen to the reasoning and the evidence. You also need to work out who are the most trusted messengers. That's meant to be a mirror, but it didn't quite work. <laughs> <laughs> and so what has shown is actually the scientific community is one of the most trusted messengers when it comes to the management of invasive species, when it comes to the protection of biodiversity. And one of the challenges in my entire career has been encouraging scientists like the ones we see here today uh, to come out and be more outspoken about what needs to happen. Um, because people like myself will come out and talk, but it isn't until independent voices from the scientific community, uh, along with the land management community, the people who are close to the ground doing this work, actually start speaking out to it. That brings a lot of uh, new, boy, uh, new people to our issue. And it's really uh, one of the most central tenets of, of you know, conservation campaigning and, and communicating these issues. So when it comes to biocontrol, if you're a scientist and you think that you're not going to have a role in fronting up to a TV camera, uh, a radio interview, or, or doing an interview with a newspaper, um, think about doing that media training and getting skilled up and stepping up into that space. The last thing is, again, going back to Daniel Kahneman and, and this concept of biocontrol, last slide, um, is this idea of risk of loss. And so, as humans, we have a cognitive bias to weight the risks or fear of losses more than pr prospective gains. Now, campaigners will um, utilise this all the time so in, to, to kind of hold on to the furniture of certain um, issues. And you'll see it in, once you read about it, you'll see it in all, a lot of the political and other communications that you will receive. i just give this example. So this is a Facebook post from last night. Last night. So um, there was a Guardian story on the polyphagous shot hole borer, and we posted it on Facebook on an Invasive Species Council page, and you can go and... And the second comment, the second comment we got is about biocontrol. So it is, just don't bring in another insect to kill these beetles. Thanks. Um, and so you can see, and this brings it back to the cane toad, 
that where people start is from an anchored position around skepticism and the risk of loss, the fear of another cane toad. And so to mitigate that fear, the challenge around social licence for biocontrol is going to be around the scientific integrity and the strength of the regulatory system that accompanies it. And if you don't have that strength of the regulatory system, um, you can pretty much guarantee you won't get a social licence. Thanks a lot. Brilliant. Thank, thank you very much, James. Brilliant. Um, I was struck by a couple of them. I was struck by so much of that. And I love your, your call for empathy in the debate. I think that's an excellent idea. And I also, I just want to um, replay one of your early comments where you used, um, you um, restated Jack, Jack Lang's statement that Paul Keating made famous, which, you know, never underestimate vested interests in a two horse race, always back self interest. Um, it's absolutely true. Uh, it's brilliant. Thank you very much. We, we've got our last speaker is um, Rita Hawkes, who's a research officer from RSPCA Victoria, talking about more social licence. First, I'd also like to acknowledge the Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of this nation and um, pay my respects. Thank you to the organisers for the opportunity to speak to you today. Just letting you know, I am a stand-in for Di Evans, who is a veterinarian and senior scientific officer for uh, RSPCA Australia. She apologises that she couldn't attend, but her absence provides me with an opportunity to do this presentation. Firstly, the RSPCA acknowledges that in some circumstances it is necessary to manage populations of wild animals, native or introduced. It is very encouraging that there is a focus on new technologies which may reduce reliance on bait, trapping and shooting, which, as we know, pose many challenges. However, it is essential when these new challenges are being developed that animal welfare is an important consideration. The RSPCA recognises that in terms of our vulnerable native species, we are in crisis and um, more than ever before, we need to protect and conserve our most threatened wildlife. However, we must ensure that the ethical principles for wild animal management are understood and adopted. Animal sentience is the capacity of an animal to experience different feelings such as pleasure and suffering, irrespective of whether animals um, are deemed to be causing negative impacts or labelled as invasive, abundant or as pests. All vertebrates and some invertebrate animals are deemed uh, are sentient and therefore have the capacity to suffer. Careful planning is essential when developing wild animal management programs and it is encouraging to see an increasing focus on identifying animal welfare risks with some attempts to address these. Animal welfare competes with considerations of efficacy, cost, practicality, environmental impact, human safety and non-target species. In the past, animal welfare has been generally considered as an afterthought or worse still, given no thought. This is likely due to the seemingly insurmountable challenges posed by attempting to resolve these issues and or the imperative to get the job done. However, over the past decade or so, there has been a greater interest in animal welfare. This is likely due to the significant relationship between animal welfare and social licence. In terms of other aspects which are considered when weighing up different control methods, we have to ask, does criteria such as cost or practical aspects have this level and type of influence? It has been acknowledged that wildlife management operations must demonstrate high animal welfare standards with the use of new and existing technologies to ensure that social licence for culling, harvesting and capture programs is not eroded. The relative humaneness model is an invaluable tool for many stakeholders and especially those involved in planning and implementing control programs. The approach focusing on relative humaneness is honest and useful as we know it is not easy to achieve a humane death in managing free-ranging animals. A particular strength of the model is that it is based on the five domains, a welfare assessment framework that incorporates impacts on mental as well as physical state and has been adopted across many different contexts. It also considers impacts in terms of intensity and duration which occur prior to death as well as the mode of death. For example, in terms of the impact prior to death, a fatal single headshot without alarming or chasing the target animal will score as low impact. However, with trapping, especially leg hold trapping, where an animal may be restrained or confined for several hours, there may be some pain, fear and anxiety experienced. 
With the mode of death, again, a single fatal headshot will achieve instant insensibility, while some toxins can cause pain and suffering for several days. Once welfare assessments are done by an expert panel, scores are allocated to the impact prior to death along the y-axis and mode of death along the x-axis, and a relative humaneness matrix can be developed with the different methods. For example, the relative humaneness matrix for pigs show that ground shooting scores the lowest for impacts and therefore scores the highest in terms of relative humaneness, whilst poisoning using yellow phosphorus scores the lowest in terms of relative humaneness. Although biological control can offer potential benefits compared to other control methods, it can pose many risks. In terms of disease and causing agents, these can cause pain and suffering. For example, based on the relative humaneness assessments for rabbit control, um, RHDV, which was discussed earlier, can cause moderate to severe suffering from hours to days. A significant issue relating to RHDV is the risk to domesticated rabbits with many succumbing to the disease. If agents are used which can affect non-target animals, safeguards must be in place to protect these animals. There is also a question of who should pay for this protection, given that these agents are deliberately disseminated. It is no surprise that the RSPCA is eager to see humane, non-lethal control methods being developed and used, particularly for fertility control. One product which is being developed in the US for urban pigeon control is OVO control. In 2021, the RSPCA was involved in seeing this, RS, this product registered by the Australian Pesticides and Veterinary Medicines Authority, which is being used for the management of minor birds, blackbirds and starlings. Several sites across Australia have started using OVO control, with a researcher involved to assess efficacy. Changing species, we are watching with keen interest the work which Ellen is doing on the potential for feline herpes virus as an vector for immunocontraception. We hope that more research into fertility control will be undertaken. The RSPCA has appreciated being included in discussions on gene drive technology, and although the main challenge relates to ethical concerns, there are some welfare risks which require consideration. These relate to situations where efficacy is high, resulting in a significant skew in the sex ratio of specific populations. Modelling of gene technology may assist in estimating the risks associated with this. One area which could be pursued more thoroughly is that of deterrence uh, of another, as another non-lethal option to be potentially used as part of an integrated program. These may have a niche application in high value ecological areas. So in conclusion, it is important that animal sentience is acknowledged when developing wild animal management programs. Also that animal welfare must be considered for accountability, transparency and social license and that there should be also a commitment to use the most humane methods available and to replace less humane methods through research. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rita. Thank you. Um, and that relationship between animal welfare and social licence is just brought out more so. As Mike, we're going to now try... This is the wonders of technology. I'm going to bring forward our other two speakers. So what, like the other sessions, what we'll be doing is taking some um, questions. So we're going to go in the room first to any questions. We've got one here and one over here, Mike. Great, thanks so much everyone. Your talks were awesome. Um, I have a question for the population modelers, um, the two that spoke in a session. When you're trying to figure out the best gene drive or immunocontraception and how they spread, what's the best way to do it, how far do you need to go in understanding the systems that they're going to be released or working in to inform accurate predictions of how they will, you know, how effective they will be or how far they'll spread, things like that? So this is to you, Exigil, and you, Ben. And you. Um, but I think you was going to have a go first and then to you, Ben. Um, yeah, thank you. That's a great question because I, I think it changes with every species and every place you look at um, and with every gene drive technology because um, we checked a few different technologies and um, with the T-CRISPR that we looked at, everything changes. Everything we know about homing drive and extra doesn't work and it comes up with new challenges. Um, polyandry becomes really important um, because sperm might be compromised a bit. Um, and um, dispersal is again very important. So you really have to know the species you're targeting and how well they're dispersing in that space that you're trying to eradicate. 
And interestingly, there's nothing really known about how they disperse mice, um, rats, and it's, there's only a few um, handful studies. Um, and their survival probabilities in nature, we don't know it. So you really have to check, um, you know, how long they're going to live, the ones that you couldn't reach with the gene drive. And so, yeah. In Thank you. Now, um, um, Ben, uh, notwithstanding that you won't have heard probably a word of that, we yeah. understand, but we'd love to hear your um, perspective on how far you need to go in understanding um, the system um, in which um, these releases are occurring in order to do the model. Yeah, no, I think uh, I think I heard it, a little bit of uh, Ashville's uh, reply, uh, and I largely just agree with that. You, you need um, a good understanding of the, of the population dynamics. You need a very good understanding of the dispersal. Um, and I think the other thing that's probably not as well acknowledged is you also need uh, a fairly good understanding of the genetic variation in the traits uh, that uh, potentially will, will a selection might be acting upon. Um, and, uh, you know, those are three easy things to list. Um, but as uh, Shigal mentioned, in many, many species, uh, we don't know uh, many of those things. Thank you, Anna Sigu. I, was, I wrote down when you made your comment, I uh, gave your talk, I wrote down, we just need data, data, data. <laughs> we need inputs. We need inputs across all those areas that Ben was talking about. Um, is there another question in the room? And then we'll go online. We'll go to online after that. Hi, thank you to the speakers. Um, this again um, probably points to Ben and Azago. Has there been any work done with, with the modelling and that with large herbivores, which are often, um, you've got a social structure with a dominant male and a herd of females and how the a gene drive would work in that population? Yeah, no, I, I haven't seen anything, but we talk, thought about it. Um, but it's so different. Their mating system is so different that it's so hard to um, incorporate that. It's going to be another challenge, I think, because you have so much skewed sex. Um, I mean, um, there's a dominant male, and then it's, you know, have harem of females. Um, so it's it's another challenge. I don't think it has been. I haven't seen any work on that, and we haven't checked it yet. So, great question. Uh, the check. question, Ben, um, was about um, large herbivores and the different behavioural structures that occur in, in, in large herbivore systems where you may have a dominant male and harems of females and, and any data available. And I see you'll let us know that she hasn't seen any at all, but you, you're also shaking your head? Nope. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Technology is beautiful. Uh, so we're going online. I'm just going to work this out. So we've got people online on one Zoom call. They're going to beam into this Zoom call. We're going to transfer the information to the people on the other Zoom call. Brilliant. Um, Sharon asks, do scientists consider social license at the beginning of their research to think about, you know, well, if it's low, if, if it's likely that the public aren't really going to want something, is there any point in proceeding? What a great question. The question was, um, and in fact, Dan, I'm going to start with you. The question was, do scientists consider social licence at the start of these research programs? Um, it, it was a question from the audience online. Um, do they consider it and should they be considering it at the start? So I would say yes, but I would say that there is different levels of social licence to consider depending on where you are on the, the research horizons. Um, what we find in talking to most people um, about, for example, Far Horizon uh, Discovery Science is that there's just so many unknowns um, that they don't know about um, to, to make their mind up about whether they think such um, research is acceptable or not. Um, in that instance, you need the research uh, to answer those questions. And so at the far end of the Far Horizon, the social license is embedded in the policies and the rules of the country in which we're doing research. But then um, if you're working right at the coalface um, on something that will have applicability in the near future, then I would say, yeah, definitely, yes. You have to be considering the social license from the very beginning as part of it. But it depends where you are on that spectrum. I, I, I think so. I'd like, love to go to James or Rita in particular, who did talk more about social license. And from the perspective of, of both of you have spoken more about the need for social license, do you have the sense that it is considered? at the start of some of these journeys? Who would like to go? You go. Well, um, or a second, go, go for it. <laughs> all three of you. 
Well, we are lucky at the University of Adelaide. We have a big group, and I think we are trying to consider all aspects simultaneously. So we have an ethics group um, working on um, as well. So it's simultaneous, I would say, but I don't. I cannot generalize. Uh, I was just going to say, I guess from my perspective, I'm not a scientist. So for me, the consideration is, um, I guess it'd be really interesting to open up the exploration of the unknown, right? And so whether science needs to factor in at the beginning or not, I think there is this scientific journey of discovery that we should still contemplate. And you don't want to think about the lack of social license, but I think that is a, a separate question to, I think, potentially the ethics side of it. Um, because social license, um, from my perspective, uh, can be built. And we don't know how to build it until we know what that discovery is from the unknown, if that makes sense. You might get to the end of that journey and realise that actually you there is no social license. There, it's going to be almost impossible to get a social license. But I, I'd argue also that so this concept of social license is so, so amorphous and so broad that you could almost get a social license for anything. Um, and I think, and what I mean by that, it's quite horrific. Yeah. But we just need to look at what happened between 1939 and 1945 in Germany, and that program had a social license. Mm. within that country, right? Mm. So that's a horrendous example, mm. but it's not, it's not to say, it, it demonstrates that social licence can be built. And I think that's a, that, that's a really important thing that you've done for us there is, is, is disentangle social licence from ethics and the requirement for both to be considered uh, differently, separately, and possibly even at different stages in the development of these tools. Uh, ben, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, look, I just wanted to, I guess, give the perspective of myself as a scientist. Um, as I said, when I first uh, came across gene drives, I, my initial, my initial um, knee-jerk reaction was, no way, I don't want to have anything to do with these, um, because uh, I, was, I was coming at it from the perspective of having worked on invasive species, and I knew that there was a lot of mistakes that had happened, right? Um, I've, I've since come almost full circle um, to now, I, I see them as actually uh, certainly gene drives and, and immunocontraceptive viruses as potentially um, uh, like the most ethical uh, way forward. And so from a personal perspective, I've, I've deliberately not been working on them until uh, I was um, calm and confident about the fact that um, these technologies really do offer um, a, a much stronger ethical alternative to many of the strategies that we're already deploying, like shooting and trapping and poisoning. Um, the, some of these new technologies are really dramatically uh, more ethically superior to, to that, I think. Thank you. I wanted to offer the opportunity um, for any of the speakers from the last session who, who talked about these development of tools, if they wanted to, Alan, or I'm not going to put any of you on the spot, but do any of you want to talk about that? Yeah, no? And Andreas up the back as well. Yeah, I mean, Stephen. I mean, the, the time scale issue is, of, yeah, is obviously something that um, that's difficult to. I mean, the, what, what the public's perception is going to be on, in twenty years' time is going to be so different to what it is now. So it's it's hard for me to tell myself, well, I'm just going to not do anything for twenty years. And <laughs> it's like, you know, you've got to start working on it. We're, we're not releasing animals into the wild now. Uh, th my sort of personal expectation, my prediction, is that. Um, eventually there will be social license. I mean, the sort of same kind of um, evolution has occurred, say, with GM foods. Um, they used to be considered, you know, <laughs> horrific um, 20 years ago, and, and and then sort of there's been a transition where people are much more accepting of it. They realise that the, the world, the, the sky doesn't fall in just because you eat some modified DNA, et cetera. And so, so for me, it's just a, it's just predicting kind of where things are going anyway and just to make sure that the technology uh, keeps ticking over so we're ready for, for that time. Did you want to say anything, Alan, or, do you, or we, Andreas wants to just add something up the back as well? Okay, here we're out here, can you Oh, it's Andreas. Okay. So I just want to give you a, a concrete example, and, and this picks up Rita's point about building in animal welfare from the start. And so with the centre and the previous CRC, there's an explicit uh, policy position to only look at progressive uh, toxins or progressive control measures. 
and, and to sort of provide that frame, you know, we're actually investing in the development of that humaneness assessment framework to be applied nationally and also working with governments and so on to develop national codes of practice and nationally acceptable standard operating procedures. And, and then if I look at our toxin development side of things, is, is trying to really look at those that would have an improved humaneness profile. Uh, and so a good example of those that just send the animals to sleep, like um, PAP or paramino propionophenone, and more recently sodium nitrite, and its, in, and its utility as a feral peak toxin. So what I'm really flagging is that, that we were building in that ethical uh, animal welfare perspective right from the start and using that to frame the entire program. And then in terms of portfolio balance, it was also not only looking at toxins, but always making sure that we had a, um, in a sense, a fertility control sort of uh, stream to the to the investments that was doing all those those things that I, I sort of outlined in, in my sort of first slide. Thank you. And then uh, just another question or comment from in the room. Yeah. Um, from the point of view uh, of the Invasive Species Council, now I, I'm a member of the Feral Cat Task Force, and I thought I was there just to make sure lots of cats got killed. But I thought that was, once I'd been there for a little while, I realised that was a big mistake. And I found out, my, I realised my role there was to slow people down and to bring the community with us, because if you go too fast and the community's not ready, you won't be able to kill any more cats. And so I found my interventions and role on that committee was most closely aligned with the work of the RSPCA, who cared passionately about animal welfare and understood what the community thought about animal welfare. And our role together was to make sure that the scientists and the land managers were deeply thinking about that and not just regarding the constraints that they saw in their work as simply an impediment, but they were actually really important to bring the community with them and to guarantee to the community, yes, we are trying to care about these things and do this correctly. We have an important job to do, but we need to do it within that broader social license they already had. Thank you, Andrew. The, um, what, an, what a good question. Thank you to the uh, online questioner. Uh, we've got another question online and then we'll come back into the room. Um, Catherine points out, alongside the brilliant research that's being done, and obviously, you know, in the room, there's lots of great research being done. Um, is there any plan for increasing the visibility and understanding of the problem and within the general public sphere of our invasive species problem and like really getting it out there? So I'll just repeat the question for the, you, the, you guys online. Is there, a, is there a plan to increase the visibility of the problem um, amongst the community so that we can then raise the expectation of a solution? But I'll come to the people in the room first, if anyone has a perspective on increasing the visibility of the problem. That's, yeah, that, that's our job. Um, <laughs> it's my job. James writ, is thinking, thank goodness, writ, that we, writ large. we need it. Um, that's the challenge. And, you know, uh, the, I guess the presentation um, that we made is because we're thinking quite deeply about how to solve that particular problem. So how do we reach the people who don't currently put nature, biodiversity or invasive species uh, high up on their, their agenda and how do we... Um, get them to consider what a future looks like without um, a lot of our incredible native wildlife and ecosystems. Dan, how about you, if from a New Zealand context, um, how are you going about that, raising the profile? Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, making the profile of the issue much higher in the public um, sector it's, it's critical. I mean, so we're in the position where I'm working for a mission called Predator Free 2050. I've got, I've, we've got to keep things going for another 28 years. And so for that kind of long-term mission, um, you've got to maintain that high level of, um, of policy and public support. So I think it's, it's critical um, that you do do that piece of work. Um, I think also though you bear in mind that that, um, that visibility is for agreement over addressing that conservation or environmental problem. Um, it, it's separate from what are the approaches taken. Um, I, I think there are two different kind of independent pieces. Anyone else want to pick up this raising the visibility? No? Great. Wouldn't might take another? Oh, no, go, Rita, do you want to? Oh, 
No, no, but just um, it, it is a very important factor, just educating the community and making them aware of, of these issues because uh, even though I think I did see it on another slide that, you know, a lot of people are concerned about um, uh, the, you know, nature and whatnot. They might not really understand yep. what the actual problems are. Yeah, yeah. And in part, this is why the Royal Society wants to have sessions like this to have available content to be able to kind of go, here's a factual-based piece of information that you could use. Are, any questions in the room? And we might... I do have one. You? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I'm actually interested in hearing from Ewan uh, in particular, and it, um, this relates to, I'll come over here as well so Dan and, um, and Ben can hear me. Um, so Ewan, yes. and also Dan, um, urgency, okay? So we're talking about horizons of 10, 20, 30 years to get some of these things going. What is the level of urgency in the biodiversity crisis? Is that too long? We'll go to you, Ewan, first, and then to you, Dan. Uh, well, it absolutely is for some species. I mean, we know that there's a whole swag of um, birds and mammals and reptiles and amphibians that are literally sitting on the edge of the cliff, and they may not have 20, 30, however many years. And that's not just due to invasive species though and I think that's really important to remember that that's due to habitat destruction and modification it's due to climate change due to pollution it's due to a whole range of reasons and we need to be tackling all of those together so absolutely as I think um, Stephen was saying we, we need to be developing these tools so that they're ready when we can deploy them but there are definitely species that can't wait for these tools and we will have to find other approaches and I guess that was part of my point this morning that we do have some levers already available to us that we could pull a bit harder and invest in more. Dan, do you want to build on the urgency question? Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's, it's not a black and white question. Okay, so we're in a period of decline. Things are going to continue being lost. Um, so it comes back again to, um, you know, public and policy perception of, you know, what is acceptable for a country to lose? And it's not just a national question, it's an international question as well. I think we do need to be doing a lot better because we're certainly not moving very fast at the moment. Um, but then there's a, a level of realism here. Uh, the real world is complicated with many issues to tackle. So I think we need to do the best we can, and we're currently not doing the best we can. I'm going to I'm going to leave that comment sitting with us uncomfortably. And thank you very much, Dan and and, and Ben, and thank you down the front as well, James and Asikul and. And Rita.